When I was a little girl, I didn't think there was anything that I liked better than ice cream. Now I'm a big girl, and I've decided there's something I like better, much better. It's called the stuff. And believe me, enough is never enough. The ship is here now, great new day sensation, light and free now. The stuff, the taste that makes you hungry for more. For this one, uh, after uh, visiting Japan with House, uh, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, we're offering up something a little more sane, and actually puts a pretty wonderful spotlight on our obsession with mass consumerism. Directed by Larry Cohen, the filmmaker who gave us uh, It's Alive, the horror movie about the killer babies. Uh, this movie is called The Stuff. The stuff begins where you have a couple of uh, miners end up uh, unearthing this uh, amorphous white substance, and one of them just, you know, gives it a taste, and is like, this stuff is really good! And in no time flat, it becomes like the hottest food stuff on the market. Well, very gradually, all the other uh, desserts and all the other treats all kind of start going out of business, so they hire a, um, a business saboteur like someone who, who's the whole you know thing is to try and find some dirt on it to try and sabotage it, and then very gradually him teamed up with a boy whose parents have kind of succumbed to it, um, come to the realization that the stuff is not only sentient but it may actually be consuming everyone who in turn is consuming it. I picked this up at a Spooky Empire, um, just at Spooky Empire Retro a couple a little while ago, and because I had heard about this and I remember as a kid actually being kind of freaked out by some of the imagery in it, because I will say the prosthetic work and a lot of the effects are actually very impressive. It was definitely made sometime in the 80s, which, let's face it, if there was any decade yeah. which perfectly defined our obsession with uh, mass consumerism, it was definitely that decade. It seemed to want to focus more on the subtext of the film, with the horror elements just kind of going hand in hand with it. So. This is definitely one to just admire more on a storytelling level. So it so. sounds a little bit like uh, another version of They Live. Yeah. They Live is a good uh, comparison, except where They Live is definitely much more larger, has a much bigger, grander scope as far as the what the aliens are doing. This one seems to have a more, uh, more specific focus on a particular aspect of our of our consumerist culture. I think okay. it's something a bit more, more about the idea of how our obsession with it has kind of like is consuming us to the point where we are, where we kind of lose our identity. Well, you know, uh, one of the things we were talking about um, <clears throat> a few minutes ago before we did this was we were talking about uh, different horror genres, and I was talking about one of the things I like, I personally like about uh, horror is when they, a little bit like science fiction, how when they hold up a mirror to us, mm -hmm. uh, or when they're doing social commentary, and this sounds like it's very much that, so I'm very... Very intrigued yeah. by this. The stuff actually has is a fascinating history. Larry Cohen, as as I said, is an established filmmaker. This one was a particular passion project of his, and actually had some very funny histories of the making of. In fact, uh, they even had a run in with Teamsters because this was low budget. They couldn't afford okay. the unions. Well, when the union got wind of what they were doing, the Teamsters got wind of it. They tried to sabotage the production, but Larry Cohen. Uh, I forget what he did, but he did something that was so ballsy that normally would get the crap beat out of him. The teams were going, you know what? We like your moxie, and they, they left him alone. Wow. So it had a limited release, and I am positive, had the circumstances landed in the right way, I think it actually would have uh, grown. I think it would have gone a, gained a substantial immediate following, but unfortunately this one quite literally was sabotaged by an act of God when a natural disaster actually wound up causing the movie theater on the night of its premiere to black out. Ah. Yeah. And unfortunately that was the premiere night and it, because it was such a limited release, its screenings were limited as well. So, so nobody got a chance to review no it. No got a chance to see it and it didn't get a chance to, and there was no chance to generate the buzz. It was only through the natural channels of it inevitably coming on television and, of course, coming on to video that it very gradually got something of a limited cult audience. And even then, it was only limited. And it's really a shame. But I remember seeing it on TV, and I remember it actually kind of sticking with me 
uh, to the point where I was always intrigued to actually get around to giving it a legitimate shot. And I finally did after buying this. I am, I am in all seriousness, I'm really uh, intrigued by this. I'm looking very forward to it. All right. And because, oddly enough, kind of rumbling in my tumbling, I think we're getting kind of hungry. Yeah. So we're going to eat while yeah, we watch Yeah, we're going to eat while we watch the stuff. What could possibly so go wrong? No! Don't eat that! I saw it moving in the refrigerator. Here, Jason. Take some. There is something alive in there. They're good for us, Jason. <laughs> they kill the bad things inside us. Must be a side effect of eating too much dessert. <laughs> We are not alone. Tonight, America is in grave danger. So are you prepared to say on the air that you've actually seen people devoured by the stuff? Oh, hell yes. And what's worse, I've seen what's left of them when the stuff gets through and comes back up. So, can't get enough of that stuff? Yeah. <laughs> very, very mixed feelings about, the about it. It's a good movie. I think my problem with it was it could have been a great movie. This is one of those times where it's like slave to the resource that we're at disposal. Because this was a low budget movie. Yeah. Um, that's why I kind of forgive a lot of its obvious flaws. I alluded to one in the beginning of this. The one major flaw that I always noticed, the editing. Like, from the first scene, when the guy starts eating the stuff, all of a sudden, boom, it's like the biggest thing. Yeah. Normally, in any other, especially high-budget movie, you get a montage leading up to that. Whereas, this one just, boom, jumps yeah. right into it. And there's a whole, and the movie is kind of littered with those. Yeah, that didn't bother me too much, or the fact that the special effects were, yeah, very low budget. I mean, I was okay yeah. with that. I mean, they did a good job with the money that they had. I, I had no problem, like, buying yeah. the fact that the stuff was sentient, and that it was living. They did a good job, like, at least selling the premise. Um, it's, for me, it was a, the, it needed another rewrite. I did not mm -hmm. like the, the, the characterization was just very broad. The dialogue wasn't very good. The, the yeah, the characterization was a little broad. Um, yeah, it, it, it needed work. Mm -hmm. But that having been said, I liked it for what you know. I liked it for what it, I liked it for what it was. It's just that I kept on watching this, going, "This could have been huge. This absolutely could have been huge." Yeah. If a few things had changed, like, this is like one of those times where I really like it for what this what this gave us. But there's something telling me. This is like one of the rare times where if they said, hey, we're going to remake it, I'm like, you know what? Yeah. This could benefit from a remake treatment, especially with a bigger budget. Because this thing still has a lot of... There's so much they could explore if they had the better resources. Well, mm -hmm. in, in the, fact that, the fact that it was done on a mild scale, the, the, the special effects really didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't think it would have bothered me then. Yeah. Um, you know, nowadays I'm looking at it going, well, yeah, but the, the movie's exactly. 30 years old, so... Yeah, yeah, we can forgive, we can forgive, sir. But even, th but even if I had saw it when it first came out, I'm not sure it would have bothered me too much. I might have giggled at a couple of the more hokier scenes, but... <laughs> so, yeah, I can see where you're coming from as far as, like, the characters, like the characterization, especially the main character, Mo Rutherford. No one is as dumb as I appear to be. Usually a character who talks like this with a very, very self-confident southern drawl being all like that, usually that guy's usually, is the villain of the piece. Yeah, because he's a terrible, terrible person, but... Yeah, and it's normally... It's just that the, and the actual fact, bad guy is so much worse. Yeah. <laughs> I think that I admit that's kind of why I enjoyed him so much, was the fact that it's not a normal character to be put in the hero position. Um, especially in his occupation being an industrial saboteur. Yeah. Yeah, it's... It's refreshingly, for even in horror movie terms, in, not even horror movie terms, but in any kind of other terms, it's not a normal place you find a protagonist character. And also, I think Michael Moriarty just was so damn charismatic. And... I'm sorry. I mean, That's I just right. ate shaving cream. Yeah, well, everybody has to eat shaving cream once in a while. The tone actually kind of, especially during the end, 
really had that rollicking, yeah, let's go get a music to it. When I was a kid, I was actually petrified at a lot of some of the scenes. I'll say the scene with Garrett Moore is when he goes, Tommy, are you, are you all right? What's the matter? <laughs> Seeing that as a kid, that freaked me out bad. But yeah, and I was really impressed with that. They, well, how yeah. well they did that scene. Exactly, and not only that, the way the, the, the reveal of the scene was actually done pretty good too. You don't think anything of it until until like a couple seconds prior to the reveal. I I remember you even yeah yeah you even reacted. You were like, oh damn yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the message. You know, you you're right. I, I mean, it's it's really good social commentary, and I would absolutely love to see a remake of it because it's even more applicable now than it even was then and it was pretty damn applicable then by extension of the fact that mo being what he is it was actually kind of cool how the heroine of the piece um even she herself would be considered an antagonistic character but it was kind of cool to see that she yeah marketing executive the marketing executive guy, for yeah, the really for the product in question i liked how she actually took up a gung-ho position i think the only this i guess you consider this maybe a minor plot hole but it's fun. I, you find it strange that a person who works at marketing the stuff has never tried the stuff. Yeah. Well, I think that's because you watched Mad Men and watched how they all had to try everything. Yeah. Well, it, that's the thing. Usually when someone is in the advertising position, usually they had to try the product before they... But for another reason, then they could tell you why they like yeah, it. Yeah, they can write the ad. They can show the ad. But I even like... Well, on the other hand, they did make a comment about some people could eat some of it and not get... That is true. So maybe she tried a and, little bit. And, and even said, depending on your strength of will, you can even resist it to an extent. And, yeah, it's pretty safe to assume that she had no problem having a couple and just not drinking the Kool-Aid. I mean, uh, ha -ha. as a kid, it was always the imagery of the stuff, like eating people, and also that's what freaked me out. But I think the thing that, when I watch it just now, I suppose one of my primal fears uh, has always been the surrender of free will. Okay. That's always been the thing that freaks me out more than anything else. Like, you got, you got people, like, even going crazy over um, which phone they have. And they're like, we subscribe to the church of Samsung. Yeah. Kind of thing. And, you, and you're just like... Or oh. iPhones. Or, or iPhones. Or, uh, I mean, I know this whole channel is practically funded by an iPhone. But I'm trying... And unfortunately, we are kind of slave to it. And, or Xbox versus PlayStation. Yeah, or, Xbox versus PlayStation. Or, 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 or Star yeah. Trek versus Star Wars versus Doctor Who. But there's no contest there. It's Doctor Who. But, um... <laughs> but that's the but that's the point. We all have that that little addiction, that one little t thing that we get a taste of, and that we just can't get enough of it. And I gotta say, the one right thing collection, yeah, the thing that freaked me out the most was all of uh, Jason's scenes with his family. Kind of, I kind of liked how you got saw the gradual progression of the family being normal in the beginning, but then you see them gradually progress into being acolytes to the stuff. Yeah, very Stepford Wives vibe. Very, yeah, very Ste I think, yeah, Stepford Wives, uh, Body Snatchers, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Yeah. Uh, that, that, thank you. That was something I wanted to mention. It really owed a lot to the B, uh, to the 50s monster movies, like we were talking about uh, yeah, The we Blob. Talking, yeah, I always felt that this was a spiritual cousin to The Blob. Yeah. Uh, the blah, the invasion of the body snatchers. There are very obvious mm -hmm. parallels there. Yeah, uh, yeah, th th things like that. So I, I, that was also very interesting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this crazy paramilitary guy goes on on the radio station. Everybody immediately believes him. Yeah, and all of a sudden <laughs> there's a big rebellion against it. When nowadays we'd be a bit more savvy to realize this is a crazy par paramilitary guy. And well, it, as we've seen, it's as the equivalent of Alex. I'm sorry, he's, he's pretty almost, much Alex. Yeah, he's, he's Alex Jones. He's this guy. Wars. This guy who says. Some crazy guy says something like that, I'm going to go, yeah, right. You exactly. Know. Um, and the, at least the one thing he had on his side was the fact he had someone who actually worked for the company. And I did like later on how he showed her actually doing public statements saying, I worked for them. I have seen firsthand what's going on. And it's so that admittedly is a very hard source to debunk. Granted. Yeah, that is granted. And I did love what Mo and Jason do to the to the high, higher up execs at the very end, like oh, pretty yeah. much giving them literal, literally a taste of their own medicine. Are you eating it, or is it eating you? Eat it. Eat it. And you could tell he he planned he, that Larry Cohen wanted to make a sequel out of this, given the, that epilogue. To the movie. You could tell he was probably secret. Um, 
I, I'm not sure I agree. I mean, most, again, we're going back to the 50s monster movies. Mm-hmm. There's always a, I, I remind you of The Blob, uh, the remake of The Blob, God Will Provide. With oh, the, oh, the remake of The Blob, yeah. With with a little piece of The Blob inside, yeah. or Invasion of the Body snap, Snatchers, ah, you know. Oh, God, that, that's or, a, that was another thing that haunted my, my childhood. I think with monster movies, you always had the it might come back, dun dun dun, even if, whether it does or not. So no, I don't think necessarily he meant for a sequel. Oh. Yeah, I, I do like the idea of okay, fine, you made it illegal. Well, congratulations, you just drove it underground. Yeah, and it's it's just going to be yet another addictive product that's going to gradually just start bringing things down. Yeah, and it's it's a fast and again eighties. Yeah, and it is kind of refreshing to see that it didn't end clean. Because, yeah, at first when I was re-watching it, after I bought it, and I watched it, I was like, this is ending a little too clean. There's no way they could cap this off. And then I saw that last thing, and I'm like, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Because yeah, I was watching it too and going, really? Everybody just buys this, and, we're, and, they're, and they're burning it, and uh-huh. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, especially as we've seen how persuasive... The stuff actually is, like, yeah. especially after you eat it, and even seeing. It, well, and I know I I would probably rationalize it as I've had a couple of car, I've had a couple things of it, and it has. I'm fine. That, I'm been, fine. So yeah, I get a little better. So I mean, you know, okay, fine. It's probably dangerous. If I eat a carton of it or something, but as long as I eat yeah, one a day, I'm probably okay. Yeah, I'm sure I would rationalize yeah, it like that. because because we always rationalize anything in excess, of course, is going to be dangerous. For right. Us. We don't think of the actually pos- the real possibility that. Something extraordinary might be wrong with this particular product, just because we've we've consumed so many things in our household that we probably shouldn't have at least maybe once a month, probably maybe once a week. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing wrong with a hamburger once a month. Yeah, exactly. But once every other day probably isn't a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> we're all we're all guilty of a particular vice in one form or another. I think this is probably the most ironic way to. Usage of a catchphrase, but I mean, is this one on the menu? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh yeah, it for me it's on the menu because I just can't get enough of the stuff. Me either. Never. That's nice. Where's the stuff? The stuff is here now. Great new day sensation. Light and free now. Stuff, the taste that makes you hungry for more.